Hi everyone, uh, my name's Tim, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm going to talk to you about World Book Day, why I think it's important, and lead into my top 10 series of all time. So, uh, first of all, it's, it's hopefully I'm uploading this on, on World Book Day, the 7th of March, Thursday the 7th of March. It's uh, in the UK, it's a day where kids get to go to school in fancy dress costumes as their favourite book characters, and there are book tokens, and it's about pushing the pros of reading to children. And I think it's something that is super important for many, many, many reasons, and I think it's a really, really good cause. So why is reading good? One, it helps with literacy, it helps with the ability to read words to uh, help uh, get the inference from words to understand what they mean when someone is telling you things. A super important skill uh, because it's something that is a whole load of people don't enjoy doing and so they don't do it and so when they see things they can't distinguish fact from fiction and it means their media literacy is poor as adults. So being able just to fundamentally read words and put them together is very important. I also think reading uh, teaches you about the world. It teaches you, you may be reading a fact book about sharks or bugs or buildings or the world, and uh, you learn interesting things about the world that you didn't know before. I also think fiction is really important for empathy because you are reading about a character that is not like you. Um, from simple differences, you may be a boy reading about a girl, to you may be reading about someone in a different time period, or someone in a different country, or someone going through something that you have never been through and will likely never go through. Um, that's why kids get sent home, <laughs> kids have projects with some quite hard-hitting books, because this is the way that children learn about the history of the world and learn to empathise with the people involved in that history. Uh, and you see what's going on in the States with banning books and things like that, and that's... If you do not let children experience those things through literature, then they will never experience those things. They will never understand why someone doesn't feel comfortable in their own skin, or why someone has to leave their home because of war or famine, um, they will, the, the child will never learn that there are people unlike them. They will lear never learn that things may be different between us, but we're all connected as humanity. And that's why I think World Book Day is really, really important. So linking with that, uh, I'm going to do my top 10 favourite series, now that that little TED talk is over. Um, this is something I've put off for a while on the channel, just because... I'm reading loads and loads of books, and stuff's going in, stuff's coming out, stuff's moving around. This is generally like a, a bit of a gut call on this. Um, so I've got a quick list, it's just on my computer over there. So uh, let's just start. So number 10 is the Sherlock Holmes series by Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, I got all of these on my Kindle, and I read them through gradually over time. Oh, they're so good. They're so good. Sherlock Holmes is a really interesting character, um, as is Watson, who is the narrator of the story. It's written from his perspective. The cases are interesting. The time period is interesting. The way that Sherlock Holmes uh, uses deduction to gauge facts about people without having to ask questions. Also, it works great in a short story format because you have a case and he solves the case and then you move on and it's great. The longer stories I think um, are still very good. I think I prefer the shorter stories more. Hound of the Baskervilles, there's a reason why it's the most famous one because it is outstanding. Um, and I do think, I haven't reread them, I don't really reread much, but it will be something that I might be interested in in future because you might forget about the cases and you come back and kind of learn it all again. Uh, I also like the fact that because Sherlock Holmes is now in the public domain, people have managed to do different things with him. Uh, and it's interesting how some aspects have now become way bigger. So Irene Adler is now like all, the third biggest character, fourth biggest character. You've got Holmes, Watson, Moriarty, and then Irene Adler. Moriarty was in like three, four stories. Irene, Irene Adler's in one. 
So interesting how that has changed over time. So number nine is a trilogy called the Fourth Realm Trilogy. And it consists of three books, like most trilogies. And it's written by John Twelve Hawks. The first book is The Traveller. The second book is The Dark River. And the third book is The Golden City. Now, you probably have never heard of these books. Uh, because they're, I found them by accident. And I thought they were incredible. So they're set in modern times. And they are about these people who are known as travellers. And what they can do is they can travel to take their spirit to different realms of existence. Uh, and it's not really about what the different realms are. You do see that. I think it's based off Buddhism. Uh, it's not about what they see in the other realms. It's when they come back, they have further knowledge. And they become they can become prophets, leaders, things like that. And you have a group of people known as the Harlequins who are there to protect travellers. Because travellers are very vulnerable. Um, especially when they're travelling, but also just with the crazy ideas that they have. Um, the revo they could be revolutionaries, and the, uh, you know, Big Brother is watching, and the system is is trying to re remove the revolutionaries, and Harlequins are there to protect them. The main villain of this book trilogy is a group of people who are trying to bring in something called the Panopticon, which is a is a term to describe uh, a kind of prison where the inmates feel like they're being watched all the time, but they're not. Or maybe they are, but it's managing with much less, fewer guards. It's used. It's about viewership and and control. And and this book came out fifteen years ago, I would imagine, something close to that. Uh, and it's coming true with, with the way that technology is running and data, how your data is being taken against your consent and used to sell you things. How we all know how our phones listen to us talk. We talk about something and then we get adverts for it. This is this is Big Brother and it is happening. And this this kind of corporate espionage to maximise revenue from you without your consent. It's something that the book series, book trilogy takes very seriously. And it looks into philosophy on, has a bit, a whole bit about free running, which is kind of before free running got really big. Uh, and you, it, which again is about the ethos of free running, how we are outside the boundaries of roads and buildings that people have built for us. And that's what this trilogy is about. Um, the Harlequins, they live a code to try and protect the travellers, and they live a very, they try to live a random existence because Big Brother, I'm going to call them that, but the the Panopticon is based on the fact that humans have repeatable behaviours. And so the Harlequins try to live a life without repeatable behaviours. They try to work in a different place every day. They try to walk a different route every day. They try to live, move house very regularly so that people don't, they can't develop those patterns that companies can profit off of. So I thought it was a great book series. John Twelve Hawks as well. It's a very interesting person. No one knows who he is. He's never met. They've never met their editor. Um, they live off the grid. Or I'm, I follow them on Facebook and they post probably about every six months on Facebook just with pictures of where they've travelled. They've travelled all around the world um, and see things and look at things in a very particular way. But their their identity is secret. And they don't do any publicity um, because they don't want to be tracked. And it's and it's great to see basically an author proposing these ideas of anti-surveillance and also backing it up with their own actions um, to to live off the grid and and to not be um, under surveillance by corporations and governments the whole time. I thought it was really interesting and it really spoke to me. And it's something that I now think about as we are progressing with this techno technology of the internet. I say this as sharing my thoughts on a platform willingly that a company will likely make money off this video before I ever will. But it's something that I'm conscious of, uh, especially now that I have children and thinking about how they are exposed to the internet and how their data is 
managed how I'm trying to to manage their exposure and, and other people's other corporations and government's access to them. Just something to think about. Uh, that was a bit of a rant. Number eight is His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. It's a trilogy. The first is The Northern Lights. The second is The Subtle Knife. The third is The Amber Spyglass. The... This is one of only two series that I've ever reread. Uh, and I read them as they were coming out and then I read them again as an adult and I got a very different viewpoint on it, which I think is one thing that makes Philip Pullman's writing very good. Uh, Lyra Balacqua, the protagonist is one of the top protagonists ever written, I think. She is complicated, she is confident, she is arrogant, she is foolhardy, but she is not annoying. She is human and, and she is so approachable and relatable but she also is something more than the reader is she is something to aspire to be she stands up to authority she fights the power and this world that this book this series takes place in worlds i should say is is interesting and exciting and fantastical but still relatable it's kind of everything has just been tweaked slightly and the key uh a key part of this mystical world that's different to ours is people have their demons, which are animal creatures that represent part of their soul. They are one and the same, you are one and the same person, the demon kind of represents who you are, and there is unspoken rules about how demons interact with each other and how people interact with other people's demons, and it's really interesting. I do think as well it works from a plot perspective of having Lyra someone to talk to about what she's thinking and what she's feeling. It's a very helpful... Uh, uh, storytelling device to have that um, but it really really works and the trilogy was written in kind of the 90s finished early 2000s and then there is a sequel kind of prequel trilogy uh, called The Book of Dust and we had two books and we're waiting for the third one I hope we get the third one this year I'll be really excited to read it uh, yeah I just it's so good I think the first book, The Northern Lights, is my favourite. I think it's outstanding and it has tremendous characters and the world is super interesting and the plot is excellent and driving and you see you see everything from Lyra's perspective. So you see a small view of it, but you could tell other things are happening. Then, in The Subtle Knife, Philip Pullman is incredibly brave and, and starts us off with a completely different book. It's set in our world with a different character. And you kind of see gradually those two worlds combine and, oh, that's brave, isn't it? To be to be like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to start with a completely different space and you're just going to have to trust me. Uh, and I, I did. I know lots of people that didn't. And then the third book, The Amber Spyglass, my wife read them and she hated The Amber Spyglass. Uh, I get why people don't like it. I do think it's not as good, uh, but it's still outstanding. And the idea, this is where you get the real religion, anti-religion aspect coming to it of of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and original sin and all those kind of biblical things and the ending on the bench is just very emotional uh so yeah that's why it's number eight uh number seven is the Percy Jackson series by Rick Riordan um I'm thinking mainly the first five books I've also read the Kane Chronicles and I've read the Heroes of Olympus series I'm looking to read the Trials of Apollo series and there's also Magnus Chase and now there's new Percy Jackson books coming out um but those original five books are just outstanding at what they do they're they're kind of children into young adult fiction they're hilarious Percy's voice is so strong um you learn loads about Greek mythology as this Greek world is interlaced with our world, but we just, we normies just can't see it. Uh, the plots are brilliant. The uh, characters are great, uh, especially with Percy and Annabeth and Grover, like the three main ones. Um, and you see the world kind of gradually expand. You see the idea of parentage and legacy and, and, you know, holding the Greek gods for what they do and what they did in those stories um, in a modern way is really, really interesting to read. And they're just so fun. They're so full of action. 
They're so full of comedy moments that doesn't undercut the tension. Just, just outstanding. Uh, number six is a fantasy series that is not finished. It is A Song of Ice and Fire by George R.R. R. Martin. Uh, I started with the TV show. I watched a, a Game of Thrones. I didn't watch it as it came out. Uh, I probably caught up season three, season four, I think, and then watched it from there on in. And we don't talk about the ending. But then uh, I read the books and the books are just, just, just brilliant. True, immense world building from George and... I read The World of Ice and Fire, I've read Fire and Blood, I haven't read the, the Hedge Knight novels yet, I'd like to read those, um, but yeah, just such an incredible world that's so similar to our own, but slightly different, uh, again, you know, it's based off the British history of, of the Battle of the Flowers between the, the Yorks and Lancasters, Starks and Lannisters, uh, but it's so much more than that, and, and the characters, how... You just get sucked in and, and everyone has a different favourite character and that's because they're all brilliant. Um, even if they're brilliant at being bad. Um, and and it was probably, certainly the show was the first, one of the first when I was like, oh, oh, this can happen. Okay. You know, disregard the fact that it's the most famous actor, disregard the fact that it's the most famous character. Uh, yeah, they're put in a situation and they have consequences for that. So... Really, really interesting uh, to watch and to read. The books are long. If people don't get into them, I, I get it. But, oh, I could just soak in the stories of, of Westeros. Um, and I can't... You know, it's really hard to talk about A Song of Ice and Fire and not talk about how it hasn't finished. I think we'll get... We maybe get Winds of Winter, but I don't think we'll ever get Dream of Spring. I think the series will never be finished. And that's okay. Honestly, that's okay. I'd rather uh, they left it unfinished than something happens and someone else finishes it off. Or if they do, hopefully George R. R. Martin has loads of notes to help them finish it off. Honestly, I don't think that's really the case. I didn't even get a chance to talk about the Greyjoys, who are probably my favourite characters. Victoria and Greyjoy is just out there being a Viking rampaging it's just brilliant. I really enjoy that. And no one seems to talk about that because that's one of the worst aspects of the book, you could say. But the rest, it's just so good. If that was a story on its own, it would be brilliant. And that's just like one of the smaller parts of this whole book series, which are just outstanding. Uh, number five is a series that I read as a child. Um, in from probably, I would guess, 8, 9, 10 into 12, 13, 14. Uh, that kind of age, and it's the Red Wall series by Brian Jakes. I found out afterwards. Jakes. I always said Jacques because it's. Uh, but Brian Jakes. This is a book series that is starts off as a bunch of anthropomorphic animals, and it's good animals, mice, badgers, squirrels, rabbits versus bad animals, foxes, snakes, weasels, stoats. And it's a set around this mythical abbey called the Redwall Abbey. And what it ends up being is this cross-generational, time, eon-spanning book series about these animals. And, and, it's, and it's riveting, and it's interesting, and it's, and it's dramatic. It's so dramatic, um, the stuff that happens to these characters. And yes, you know, it has... The tropes of a brave warrior has visions, you have magical artifacts, you have the good guys beating the bad guys, uh, you have the hilarious, uh, the rabbits, the hares are my favourite characters, what what? And it's just a world that I inhabited for a very long time. I think there's 17, something like that, books in this series. Uh, I didn't read the last few, I didn't read the last three or four because I grew out of it, ultimately. Uh, I was kind of 15, 16 when those books came out, and, and they are for younger readers. Uh, now that I've got kids, I can't wait to get it out of the loft. I've got all the books that I have growing up, I've got them in the loft. I can't wait to get those Red Wall books out uh, to read to my kids, I think. And if not, I'll read them again to myself, most likely. Uh, yeah, just, they were the series. They were the series that whenever I went in a bookshop, I would always look for those books. First, every single time. 
is there a new one? Is there a new one? You know, my mum bought the big hardbacks of this children's book series for me because I love them that much. So uh, that has to be up there. Uh, next, number four, is a book series that I only finished reading this year. Which, maybe last year, this year. I don't know, time is a weird secret. Very recently, anyway. And that is, and it's, I almost didn't put this in the list because it's so new, but I just, the more I thought about it, I just thought it was excellent. Every single book was brilliant. And it is Legend of the Condor Heroes by Jin Yong. The, the first book is A Hero Born. The second book is A Bond Undone. The third is A Snake Lies Waiting. And the fourth is A Heart Divided. These are four volumes of one story. Uh, it was written in the 1950s, published in Hong Kong. It's, it's the front, you know, blurb says the Chinese Lord of the Rings. The third, the fourth, kind of, they realise actually how popular the translation is and how popular the book series is. So you've got Ken Liu, writer of uh, Grace of Kings, and the Dandelion Dynasty, which is incredibly popular. And you've got Fonda Lee, writer of the Greenbone Saga, which is another very popular modern fantasy series, both saying, like, these are the books I read growing up. These are incredible. Um, and and they are. They're, they're historical kung fu wuxia uh, epics and the characters go on such journeys both literally literally and internally especially that last book really really hits on the character development and the best and worst parts of humanity but it's just full of adventure it's full of meeting wacky characters and cr doing crazy kung fu and the main character just progressing and progressing and progressing. It's about honour. It's about doing what's right. It's about doing what you said you would do. And maybe that's not necessarily the best thing. That's something that we learn towards the end. And uh, yeah, it's just, it was so good. It was just so eye-openingly good. And it was all because my brother bought me the first book for my birthday because it said Chinese Lord of the Rings on it. And he was like, oh, Tim likes fantasy, so I'll, I'll buy it for him. And just incredible. So, 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 so good. Uh, yeah, it spans time, it spans countries. It's all set with the backdrop of the Genghis Khan invasion of China. And, and you see this thing growing, this storm growing in the distance and, and, and going in, and it's, it's all just happening in the background and you're like, oh, is it actually going to happen? And then it does and it's like, wow. Um, you see two brothers... Uh, figurative brothers, sworn brothers before they were born, and how one, how they just take different paths, and and it was so interesting, and it's great to see how all of these, there's hundreds of characters, and they're all connected. Um, I was going to do uh, a video with like a big flowchart on how everyone is connected, but uh, it made my brain hurt. Um, but the writer, you, you're on the journey with it, and you just go with it, and it's so good and it's fun and the action's incredible i've never seen action described that way before it's tragic it's romantic it's it's, it's sweeping just epic brilliant um number three is a book series for young adults called mortal engines by philip reeve uh the first book is called Mortal Engines, the second... Oh, I'm in trouble here. The second book is something. The third book is Infernal Devices. And the fourth book is A Darkling Plane. What's the second book called? I can't remember right now. Um, this is a young adult fantasy series set post-apocalyptic where the towns and cities have motorised and become mobile, huge tanks and go around and blow up each other and eat each other they call it municipal darwinism and it's a really cool concept it's just a flat out super cool concept of these towns cities going around and trying to eat each other um and you see what the main one you see certainly to start with is london and how london has grown and you have like st paul's cathedral is still on top and you have names of towns uh, names of boroughs acting as parts of this huge machine. It's a very cool concept. Uh, what elevates it, though, is 
the characters and the plot. The characters, you have uh, people trying to do their best. You have people who are very emotionally damaged and never really fully recover from that emotional damage, which is nice to see. It's not just like, oh, now that someone loves you, that means you're cured of everything wrong with you. Um, all the damage that you've seen, no. And 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 uh, Hester, the main, probably the main character, um, is it carries those that damage around with her forever. The plot takes huge swings of, hey, this thing's. What if this thing happens that could destroy the world? Yeah, it's going to happen. Boom, it happens. Oh no, what are we going to deal with that? Um, and then Philip Reeves and also takes huge risks. Uh, there's a big time jump in it. We have a whole different generation of characters. Uh, we see how small parts of the world grow and grow and grow. And you see everything in this weird space of towns trying to eat each other. Everything makes sense in the logic of the world. And then for me, something that really, really elevated it uh, was the the last book. We have sweeping drama, massive drama incredible tension characters and factions moving against each other with a group of characters in the mid the main characters kind of stuck in the middle of this and the ending is so poetic and and has oh i'm getting emotional just thinking about it has such a quality to it that i will remember reading that forever and this was a book series that i started reading and uh i was like this is for me one of the best things I've ever read. So I needed to space it out. I can only read a book every six months. Otherwise I'd just read them all. Uh, and, oh, I'm so glad I did because I just had the experience of being in this world and reading these books for two years. If I'd read, I could have read them all back to back and got them done in a month. But but now I have that time with those books um, to, to to remember them. And and Tom and Hester and, and Stalker, uh, Shrike the Stalker, just just... Oh, so good. So, so good. And I recommend, I, yeah. And then they made a movie of it. Uh, and I never even watched the movie. I haven't seen the movie yet. Uh, I've heard it's not very good. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. One day I'll find it. Now, number two is uh, a fantasy epic, a book series that I'm looking to possibly reread. One of only two that I've ever read. This might be the third one. And that's Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. So, uh, I read The Hobbit when I was 10, in year 6 at school, and brilliant. Oh, it's so good. It's, and that's actually a book I've reread. I've reread The Hobbit. Uh, but it's a uh, epic, it's adventure, it's fun. You have these crazy dwarves trying to steal uh, a dragon's horde. You have Bilbo Baggins is, is this hobbit that does not want to go on the adventure and kind of gets dragged along against his will <coughs> um and leads to an epic a really fun children's story and then there's one bit which is kind of one of the many vignettes of action about uh, riddles in the dark with this ring that can make bilbo go invisible and and what lord of the rings is about is what if that little trinket was actually incredibly evil and dangerous and what we see is an epic tale of a whole world of middle earth being changed by some of the smallest people and for this you know you talk about the plot it's just people walking the language is exemplary the the characters are so heroic and realized and and I, it's just could never just imagine you could just be in the world you're in the world when you're reading it you can hear the songs you can smell the grass you can touch the trees and i don't think there will ever be anything like it uh because because there was nothing like it at the time you know and just i do think that the movie adaptations were incredibly good uh, and helped helped me kind of reinforce that story in my mind. I did watch the films and then read the books. Uh, so, yeah, just... It's Lord of the Rings, man. Like, you know what I mean? It's so universally praised. 
that no one else you can't really add to the discourse because because it's all been said before it's it's the best fantasy series of all time it's the granddaddy of fantasy it launched a thousand knockoffs um it changed the publishing industry just just incredible just absolutely incredible and um i've got the silmarillion here as my mystery book uh and after that i might read lord of the rings again honestly because just talking about it has made me motivated to read it but it's not my number one number one is a book series uh, one of the only other one that I've reread outside of his dark materials, and I'm looking to possibly read it again. And it's Harry Potter. I know. One, I'm a millennial, so yeah, of course I love Harry Potter because for a whole generation of people, it kind of summed up their personality for a long time. Um, yes, I know everything that's gone on post Harry Potter. Uh, both uh, literal, like in the stories with the follow-up films that I think have major, major problems and uh, both on screen and off screen and I'm glad they've kind of gone away. I did kind of enjoy them though, some of them. Mm. Um, I've got an idea on like how if I did those films, how I would do them. If you're interested in that video of my breakdown of how I would make uh, Fantastic Beasts a, a good film... Uh, let me know. But uh, for me, and, and obviously all the J.K. Rowling stuff, and that's really sad to see. It's sad to see um, someone who I greatly admired growing up. I'll always remember when she got a gold Blue Peter badge for, for services to literature. And she cried. She cried on Blue Peter because she was so proud of getting a golden Blue Peter badge. And she never thought that she would ever get one. I remember reading that she was the one of the first person to ever come off of the Forbes rich list due to charitable donations. She set up a whole wing. She bought a whole wing for a hospital up in Edinburgh for her mum, uh, in memory of her mum. She did all these great things. And she was a proponent for justice and and looking after people. And then and then everything's changed, and I'm not gonna get into that. But I still I was struggling to separate the art from the artist for, for quite a long time on this. And and again, you go into like Primark and there's Harry Potter stuff everywhere. And it was it was all enveloping and you knew that money was not necessarily going to the right places. And it was hard. It was hard to be a Harry Potter fan. Um, and then for me, we went to uh, Universal Studios in California with my kids. And we went to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. And my son and my daughter, who uh, were four and six at the time, started asking questions. What's this funny hat? What's this wand do? Why is there a broomstick? What is this shop? What's this castle? And I started talking about it. And just to see their eyes light up and, and their imagination be captured by the whimsy and, yes, the magic of Harry Potter, it, it took me back. I went back in time. And this is this is something that, you, you find those pieces of media that take don't just act as great pieces of media, they act as time-travelling machines. You have that favourite album, you put it on, you remember where you were when you first heard that album. You don't remember, you're taken there. That's, that's part of it. You can, and for me, that's Harry Potter, is, is, is being in that world, being that kid, reading about this whimsy, magical world that... that I wanted to be a part of so much. I wanted my letter to Hogwarts. Um, I wanted to do all the classes. I, I I wanted to be in a house. I wanted all that. I wanted all that. And to see Harry Potter... Uh, first of all, you know, I, I, I think the first two books were out when I started reading them. But I was, I was the, basically the same age as Harry Potter as they were coming out. It was so relatable to me. Uh, everything that... I was struggling with at school, Harry was struggling with at Hogwarts. It was so connected for me. And and as the books got longer, I got more grown up and I could read these longer books and I could really appreciate them. And it's just incredible that, you know, it was the biggest book series ever. I don't I really don't think it'll ever be topped um, in terms of a, a, a cultural phenomenon uh, of the time, you know, me and my mum bought separate books so we could both read them at the same time and I would read them before she'd even picked hers up. 
Um, I was the one staying up all night reading it and being really, really sleepy at school the next day. I, I was the one who was just thinking about it all the time and the weight between books, the, 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 the incredible, uh, build up of, of excitement between those books, knowing when they were going to come out, looking for them and, and they nailed them. That's the thing. You know, I talked about Game of Thrones earlier on. That's a book series that will never be finished. J.K. Rowling uh, wrote in, wrote, published in eight, nine years, seven books, finishing the series. She finished it. She didn't have to. She finished it. And it, na it nailed it. It was so good. It grew up with the reader. And, and I can't, I experienced them as a child growing with them. Then I reread them uh, when I was probably in my early 20s, late teens, early 20s. Um, and it was just incredible seeing the foreshadowing. Um, and now I can't wait to experience them as a parent. Uh, we've already seen the first two films. Um, I'm going to... I know my son's probably a little bit young. Uh, he's now seven to start reading them. But but oh, I just can't wait. And he was asking me about him. He's got Harry Potter pajamas, and he's starting to get into the world. And, and my daughter loves the fact that all the owls and, and the broomsticks and the witches and the magic and and all of this came be from a, a children's book about a boy who was unloved by his family and uh, has now has been adopted into this magical world. And as someone who has adopted two children, that also hits me. Um, and yeah, it's just, it will always be my favorite series. I'm really sorry. Uh, I know, I know there's all the other baggage, but I have such a close emotional tie to, to the Harry Potter series. And I thought that was waning. I honestly thought that was waning. And then just going and seeing my kids be super excited by the magic, the real magic happening, um, has, has started it all again. And they're all up in the loft. All my Harry Potter books are up in the loft. And I can't wait to bring them down. I can't wait to read them to my kids. Um, probably not this World Book Day, but maybe next World Book Day. So anyway, this is probably my longest video I think I've ever done. Um, it started off about World Book Day and it ended up being a big long rant about my top 10 favourite series. If you're still here, thank you. Thank you for still being here. Um, I think... The weather, the British weather has made the lighting horrific in this video. Um, but I don't, I don't care about that. Um, I care about these books and I care about World Book Day being super important to children and to adults, um, to parents. Uh, yeah, so if you've got, if you would like to see me do a, hey, what if I did the Fantastic Beasts movie? Please let me know because I've got some ideas. Uh, and I'd like to put that out into a video. It's not very much a booktube video, but it's something I'd be possibly interested in doing. Uh, let me know your top 10 series below this. God, this video is so long. <laughs> anyway, I've been Tim. Give this video a thumbs up. Please subscribe if you like more of these rants. Usually they're a bit shorter, but I thought I'd do a special video for World Book Day. And anyway, get out of my house!